Thank you. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank all the organizers of this conference. This has been fantastic. I've, I've had a really good time these last few days. Um, all right, so I am Louis Montez, Montez Lou on most um, social network things, Twitter and GitHub and wherever else that handle is still available. Um, uh, like uh, Alex just mentioned, I run iSDev in the US. Uh, we do full stack JavaScript, so Node.js, um, React, or whatever up front. Um, and we've actually gone a little further than that in recent years, uh, going past the browser and into uh, hardware IoT related projects. So we're an Internet of Things company mostly lately. So um, just uh, this past Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, there was a bunch of really, uh, really cool products released with internet connectivity. In fact, one of them you could, uh, at least one of them, you can use your, your iPhone, well, only your iPhone, uh, no Android support, and um, you know, search for their product, install their app, accept permissions, um, sign up, discover on the network uh, locally a uh, device, press a button on your screen, and a button would be pressed in the physical world right in front of you. So what a time to be alive, right? All right. Um, so of course, IoT has been mostly marketing, but there is actually some tech um, that's come out of this, right? So uh, recent years, there, there's been a few things that have helped us to actually realize some of these amazing uh, products. Uh, there's been uh, a whole lot of really inexpensive uh, boards, right? Arduino, um, like over the last decade, uh, Raspberry Pi, and these things are you know, really easy to get started with, so we can prototype things really quickly. Um, it also helps that um, you know, half the people in the world have a supercomputer in their pocket with uh, you know, an internet connection. That, that helps out quite a bit for IoT as well. Um, but the, you know, one of the things I'm really interested, though, is just sort of the uh, ubiquitous bi-directional communication, right? We've, um, you know, historically, especially with the web, have made requests, got responses, um, but we have been doing a lot more server push um, in recent years, and it's gotten a lot easier to do it. So that's a, that's a big part of this. But let's start off with the uh, embedded hardware. So we are um, front end, or at least uh, since this is the front end half, of, uh, uh, of the conference. There's probably a lot of JavaScript developers in here. And anybody that wanted uh, to do JavaScript and robotics or you know, little IoT things has probably started here. So the first commit to the Node serial port repository was September 7, 2010 by Chris Williams. And this sort of started the whole uh, Node bots movement. So let's say, um, well, be before I get there, with um, with Node Serial Port, I mean, it's a very popular project now. It's got a lot of contributors. But what I really like what they did is a really simple API. So uh, this should look familiar to anybody who's done Node. It's an event emitter, right? So we can, if we want to read data, or at least data events as they come you know, to us sort of asynchronously, uh, we just add an event listener, so on data, and we get, uh, we get some data every time that comes across the wire. And if we want to write data, uh, we're typically sending like a, a buffer, a node buffer, or a uint8 array. And uh, you know, we just have a series of bytes. And you know, we use express those as like uh, hex codes, so, um, or 0 to 255. Or you know, if you want to be real specific there with uh, bits, you can do that um, as, a, as a literal in JavaScript. So let's say I want to connect. Um, using JavaScript, using Node.js specifically, to a, uh, a piece of hardware, like an Arduino Uno. So Node Serial Port is perfect for this. And the way this has been working historically is we have our Node program fire up, establish a connection to the serial port. And the uh, first thing we do is we you know, ask the uh, Arduino uh, what its version is. And that version is the version of Fermata. So this is a, uh, a common sketch that we've been using to um, to automate these pins. So every one of these Arduinos or one of these boards have uh, general purpose inputs, outputs, so we can turn switches on, we can listen for changes in current so that we can you know, like connect a sensor, things like that. Um, but Fermat is a really good way of doing this, especially, and it doesn't really have to be Node, but this is really easy to do with Node. And you know, of course, there, um, this thing shoots us back a message asynchronously of you know, what its version is. Um, and uh, then typically the process is, OK, uh, Arduino, what can you do? So give me a, a capability query. I'm going to do a capability query, and you're going to stream me back 
all the pin descriptions, like, you know, pin 13 can do digital in and out, and, you know, pin uh, 3 can do uh, pulse with modulation, like variable um, amounts of current going out, things like that. All right, sweet. We've got um, a description of the pins. We've sort of bootstrapped this connection, and we could do something like, yay, turn on pin 13. So the reason we always do this is the hello world of electronics, right? We need to see that something actually happened from our JavaScript code or whatever language to the physical world. And that's why turning on an LED always seems silly, um, that we're <laughs> making all these steps to flip a light switch. But it's to show that we have connectivity and that everything's working. Um, of course, we don't want to send all those bytes and know how to do like what the things are. In those last slides, those were the actual um, bytes that are going across for Fermata. But um, that's a lot to do. So um, fast forward a couple years after Node Serial Port, and uh, Rick Waldron made the first commits to the Johnny Five library, which is basically an abstraction for doing uh, robotics. And uh, this has become a very popular project, you know, over 100 contributors. It's, um, it's really good stuff. And instead of having to know what to send down the serial port exactly, we've got some abstraction like create a board. Um, when that board's ready, maybe create uh, an LED and then blink it. Or you know, have a, a sensor that gives us the temperature or um, have a you know, servo motor to move a robot's arm. And you know, we have like, high-level APIs for all this. And uh, fast forward a couple more years, and uh, Rick did the first um, decoupling of making it something specific to Arduino and allowed for other boards. So he uh, made the, uh, the Galileo, which was an Intel board. He got that to work. And then everybody else sort of uh, jumped on board. People all over the world were creating uh, plugins, these I.O. classes that can go into Johnny5 to support all kinds of other hardware. And some of these boards were uh, you know, a lot more powerful than, say, an Arduino. Uh, so we could run you know, Linux and Node.js directly on the board. So they wouldn't have to be tethered at all. The robot logic is all happening right there on the, on the embedded platform. And um, over these last few years, the, the movement of, of Node.bots, Johnny5, all of this, um, you know, there's been uh, uh, RobotsConf, uh, there's been a lot of this stuff at uh, JSConf, and, and the movement has grown uh, quite a bit with people doing JavaScript and robotics, and uh, once a year there's International NodeBots Day, so all over the world people get together and uh, build robots, and this is the event that happens over in Phoenix, and there's been four of them so far, so uh, four years in a row, started off just doing the tethered Arduino thing uh, to uh, Fermata, uh, moved on to uh, Wi-Fi, and eventually Bluetooth, so it's, uh, it's been progressing, and you know, it's a whole day of robotics, and at the end of the day, we smash the robots into each other. It's kind of fun. Um, and you know, there's been a whole lot of creativity that's come out of that as well. Um, so you know, people start by putting the robot together and getting the thing to move, but then they want to do something like, oh, I want to put a web dashboard on front of this thing so I can have some buttons and things to, you know, to build a UI more than just you know, command line node. And so typically, we'll uh, have a, uh, a node server, right, like Express or Happy or something like that. And that takes requests in, fires up Johnny5, you know, and you build a dashboard. And then you're like, OK, but I want this really you know, interactive. I don't want to just make Ajax calls from my front end. I want to do like um, have sensors push you know, event source down or use socket IO, you know, some web sockets to do things in real time from my, uh, from my dashboard to my node process running Johnny5. Um, or uh, MQTT, which is another uh, IoT type transport to do publish and subscribe back uh, you know, over a web socket or just a direct TCP socket. Uh, back to that, and um, but so so that's a that's a great start. And what I really like about progressive web apps is you know there's there's been a couple of uh, of great talks already on on this. So I'm not going to go too detailed onto what the progressive web apps are. But uh, we already know at high level there's a service worker that intercepts things so that um, we uh, all network requests can go through that so we can run the things offline. We can put a manifest in the thing so we can get an add to home screen button. Um, we can do push notifications, so we can have like a server um, send a message to our service worker, wake it up, maybe bring up the page, but it could also send a, an encrypted payload as well. That used to be a thing where you just send a notification, and then the web page or the, the service worker would tell the web page to make a request to get data to come back. But we can just do that all as, as one thing now. And um, you know, they're supposed to also be uh, fast, secure, and responsive. But and this is really good, and we can um, just add that right now um, to these existing things we've been doing you know, with Johnny5 and IoT. Um, but that just kind of gets us to where native apps are in a way, right? Like that is not um, pushing it forward as much as like catching up to, uh, to native Android and iOS applications. But there are some things that the web just does better, at least in my experience here. 
um, not, you know, not just the deployment and, and you know, not being in a walled garden or anything like that, um, but um, what's already been talked about as well is uh, uh, WebRTC. Now, now, this is actually a really big deal, and this is why it's, I've heard a couple of talks here about this already, and Nikita's was, was really good and really detailed, and this is not detailed, um, but just a real simple story here. Imagine we got, um, we'll call him Peter, and uh, Peter wants to send something really important over to his uh, good buddy, Varys. Now, um, Peter doesn't really trust, like, Facebook Messenger or, um, or Google Chat, so he doesn't want to go through somebody else's network to send this important information over. He wants to just send it directly to him. And it was discussed before, um, there, there are some things that have to happen. We can't just go straight, uh, you know, peer-to-peer. -peer. We have to go through, at, at, the very, at the very minimum, we have a, a stun server, which is how, you know, our browser on one side of the internet figures out how to tunnel out. And so he gets response back from the stun server. And what does that look like? How does uh, he take that stun message, use his browser to create something that he needs to get over to Vera? So he creates uh, this offer. It's about 5K worth of JSON. And I don't understand everything in this. Um, but what's important is he needs to get that over. So we talk, uh, there, there was talk earlier about a signaling server. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a server. Um, in fact, while a WebSocket, like between two, uh, two peers, could uh, be a really quick way to get this 5K over to the other person, um, it's not nearly as fast as a Raven. So a Raven can have that message bundled up and go over to the other guy. Um, Varys, on this, in this case, you know, can, can transcribe that message. He could put that right into his browser, who talks to a Sun server, and gets an answer. That answer looked very similar, um, another big blob of JSON. That has to get back to Peter. Now, this stuff could be all, like I said, out of bound. That was what was mentioned earlier. But it doesn't have to be an actual signaling server. It could be anything. And uh, he doesn't like Ravens. He's going to send this back over Gmail so he could just copy and paste it. And yay, Peter is able to establish now a direct uh, link. And just like we had uh, sort of the bi-directional communication with serial port, like we have with WebSockets, um, on message, very important. Either one of them could read events that come in. And of course, either one of them can, uh, can send things out. So, so very helpful, and very helpful for, um, for IoT applications and sort of expanding what we're able to do with the web um, using, using peer connections. Um, but OK, what does that got to do with putting browser uh, robotics together. Um, it, it, just think of all these things as a toolbox, right, to, to connect every little, every little piece. But can we just um, take Johnny Five and use uh, Webpack or Browserify and just expect it to work and talk to, um, uh, talk to a piece of hardware in Arduino? Um, typically, what do we do? We, are, we have some problem like this with the web. So we'd want to wrap it in some sort of thing and deploy it to a store to have more access for something, right? Well, um, you might not need to do that. You might not need a wrapper. You might be able to do these things directly from a browser. OK. So anybody heard of MIDI? Old school, right? MIDI's great. Um, and MIDI's for making music, right? MIDI is for uh, playing notes or receiving notes. It, it is for that. But what you can do is emulate a MIDI device. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, Arduinos that can emulate any USB peripheral with just a very small amount of code. Um, some of the newer uh, Maker Arduinos, the older uh, Leonardo Micro, they can all be any peripheral, uh, USB peripheral you want. And there's a, a very easy to use Arduino library to, uh, to make USB devices, but also another layer on top of that to, say, be a MIDI device. OK, so, but the MIDI protocol is um, actually pretty, uh, 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 pretty constrained, right? We um, know there are certain things we can do, like play a note on this channel you know, with the first byte, um, which key, you know, 0 to 127, uh, what velocity we're going to strike that key. So if we're like, playing a piano, it's on this channel, this note, this velocity. But it turns out, even though we're, we're, we're constrained to what those bytes are allowed to be, that range, um, the, the peripheral that we want to talk to doesn't really care. But if you think about it, if we've got like 64 values in the first byte that we can be, that's six bits of arbitrary data. 0 to 127 in the middle, 0 to 127, another 7 bits, 7 bits. we got 20 bits to play in. Because it doesn't actually have to be a musical instrument. And what's really nice about this is 
since this seems like such a benign thing to do, to just send notes or listen for notes, you can usually get away with the browser not even prompting you for access to MIDI ports, which is, is very handy. And just like um, the other APIs that I was saying, where we have a read and write, um, this is just as simple. It, it's not you know, the typical event emitter, but it is, you know, we're putting a callback of what happens when a MIDI message comes in, we got data, and our output send takes yet another uh, array buff or, uh, another uh, uint eight array or a buffer of, of bytes. Um, however, these need to be in that format, right? They need to be in those ranges, or they'll throw an exception in the browser. Um, you know, the, the thing about like doing that low-level bit manipulation is that um, I, for years and years, didn't ever have to do that. It didn't help me to make an enterprise application to know how to move bits around. Uh, but some people have um, been doing this, and they've made some really cool libraries on top of it. So if you just take the time to figure out, okay, yeah, this like bit shifting, and I don't want to do all that, but if you just spend a little bit of time on that, you might be able to enable some piece of hardware that is very constrained and that you really need to worry about just what's going into it. So um, the stuff that you might have done in computer science that um, didn't have a whole lot of use, very useful if you're doing any of this robotic stuff. OK, so um, if you don't want to use MIDI, although MIDI is super great for this right now because MIDI is available. It's been for a few years, at least in Chrome. It's, um, there's an open issue on Firefox, and there has been some work. Actually, just three weeks ago, uh, there was a commit uh, to do input stuff. It's not, um, it's not production ready yet, though. Web USB, however, as of Wednesday, is stable in Chrome 61. So we can use this. So what, what is web USB? That sounds like super dangerous, right? Like just generic web USB access? Um, well, there's a lot to getting to, the web US, uh, to a USB port through uh, web USB. Uh, you have to be on HPS. Um, the, uh, you can't even start until it, you, know, you answer a dialogue that's popped up. And that dialogue is prompted by the, um, a, a DOM click. So you can't just load a page and have it, um, have it connect you have to instantiate that from a user interaction. You also have to put filtering criteria of just which devices you're looking for. You have to be real specific and say it's uh, this particular vendor and product ID. So, um, but once you get past all of that, you know, it's, if you're building for a specific device, um, th this isn't too bad. In fact, all of those devices that I was just showing that can do um, uh, MIDI can also do this web USB, and then you're not constrained to just certain bytes. You just get to full blast uh, bytes back and forth to a device from the browser. And uh, this is a little bit more complicated because there's more um, options on how you send things, um, like there's bulk transfers and, and more transactional things, but in the end, really just reading data, sending data, input output, just like everything else. And we're dealing with, uh, with arrays of bytes, just the same. Okay. Uh, so, Bluetooth, another way of connecting. Um, now, Bluetooth historically, um, if you've never done like Bluetooth for robotics, Bluetooth has been about uh, like pairing your phone to your speakers or something like that, right? These are um, older Bluetooth uh, profiles. But as of Bluetooth 4, which has been around for, for several years now, we've got the ability to do Bluetooth low energy devices. And this is actually very, very different than the old way of pairing. Bluetooth low energy devices let something like uh, go to sleep for a long time, wake up, do a thing. One of the things that they go to sleep for and wake up is to beacon. Um, so imagine um, th this little tiny device running on this coin cell battery, sleeps most of the time, wakes up once a minute or however, whatever interval you configured it for, and I don't know, shoots out a URL um, like some people in the audience tend to do. Um, and that is called um, the physical web. It's using um, a, a byte format called Eddie Stone. It's basically uh, encoding a URL into this packet that's being advertised every so often. And this is actually really cool in that it gives us a starting point, right? So if you've got this URL that's coming up and it just shows up on your phone out of nowhere, that might be because there's a piece of hardware that we might want to interact with. And we can take that a step further. Cool, we're at this URL. We've opened up this, say, progressive web app. Um, to, uh, to talk to something potentially directly. So the Bluetooth low energy stuff, unlike the, um, the, the older style Bluetooth, the you know, Bluetooth 4 on up, um, has what we're calling uh, Bluetooth services. So imagine something like a heart rate monitor has got a heart rate service. It can have multiple services as well. 
Now, these uh, services have characteristics. A characteristic is like where the data is accessed at. So if uh, a service is a heart rate monitor, so we might um, you know, ask for uh, subscribe to notifications on the heart rate changes. So we're able to read like events in, in real time, or we could potentially have a characteristic that lets us write something back. And this heart rate monitor is just an example because it's one that's sort of already uh, known. We're using like service IDs that are common but we could make these up. These could be anything. So this is like an arbitrary communications channel that doesn't have to be something that, you know, like some approved vendor specified. You can grab a Bluetooth Arduino and just say, I'm going to create a service that does this thing. Um, and if anybody's done a Bluetooth Low Energy with Node, uh, they've likely been using Sandeep Mystery's project called Noble. And Noble's great for, for Node, very easy to use API. Uh, what I like about Noble as well is since um, a lot of Node projects, uh, like um, the Rolling Spider, the, uh, the little drone that's web Bluetooth, all of these things that were written against the Noble API, there's now a shim, so you can take your Noble Node.js Bluetooth code and get that to run on top of web Bluetooth um, using, using like Browserify or Webpack. And okay, so. Um, so that's pretty cool. We can establish a connection. Um, this also, ha when we're using web Bluetooth, when we want to establish a connection, we have um, some similar constraints to what we were doing with web USB. So with web USB, it has to be uh, an SSL sire, HTTPS. Um, there has to be some user interaction. We have to specify just which services we want to talk to as well. A dialog will come up, it will connect to it, and then we'll actually pair with the device. And once we're paired, it's a one-to-one -one thing, a device connected to a, um, to a computer, to a, to a phone. And uh, once we have one of these service connections and we you know, sort of iterate through its characteristics, we can um, ask for on data or write, just like the event emitter, just like serial port. And in fact, a lot of these Bluetooth devices are using a common service called uh, Nordic UART. And that basically ends up being just like serial port, except it's it's wireless, um, and there is a Bluetooth low energy serial port implementation that we could plug into uh, Fermata and do the, the robotics that way if we want to. Um, okay, so uh, here's another one, and this one's super, super early, so um, this is very subject to change, I imagine, um, but there is a W3C spec on top of it, and that's near field communication. So. Uh, this is, like I said, it's really early, but yet another way for us to take a device and potentially send arbitrary bytes be between a couple of devices, right? So we can have our phone, um, which has an NFC reader, and it could also project um, NFC messages. What does that look like? If we want to um, expose some bytes uh, to something else that's going to pick those up, um, we're using web NFC push. So navigator NFC push, hello world. If something wants to read that, so on the other side, it can set a watch to listen for NFC messages that it gets close to, right? So NFC watch, do something, all promise-based, and that, that should work pretty well. Okay, so I went faster than I should have, but I'm gonna start doing demos. Hardware demos are the dumbest thing that you could possibly do as a speaker, so I'm gonna do the dumbest thing possible as a speaker and do a hardware demo. Um, a little bit of setup here. Um, those uh, Leonardo's, the, those things that can do um, USB peripheral, um, this is a knockoff, a Pro Micro, that was like a $3 version of that, but it's able to use a library, so that's pretty cool. The uh, top right thing, that is a accelerometer from a Tessel. Um, Tessel is one of those other boards that's supported by Johnny Five. What I really like about what they did is uh, those modules, yeah, they're, they, like, they fit really well into a Tessel, so they're really great for a Tessel, but they're also using a common standard to communicate, um, something called I squared C. It's um, a, uh, inter, yeah, I2C, look it up. Anyways, it's um, a way to uh, connect just microcontrollers to microcontrollers, integrated circuits to integrated circuits. Um, and we can take the accelerometer data off of that and uh, push it into um, this Arduino. Now, why do I have a QR code? Because uh, there's um, you know, another new sort of experimental web API that I kind of want to show off as well. Um, Jen, in her talk yesterday, showed what, um, what they were doing with faces. 
Um, and faces are really cool because you get, you know, um, the position of the face and potentially um, where the eyes and mouth are at and, and like a bounding box around somebody's head. Um, what I like about the QR code part of the shape recognition API is you could have data in there, right? So that, um, that's cool because we could have position, but we could also have data. And if, we, uh, if we're doing IoT things, we typically have our data described um, as, our device is described as a UUID, right? If anybody's done anything with IoT, it's basically 16 bytes, it's this big ugly number. If you're gonna do that, don't put the dashes in it. For some reason, we, we do like 32 characters and four dashes, and I don't know who came up with that or what the reasoning is, but 36 characters is just past the threshold of cool QR codes and into the really like nasty high resolution ones. So just take out those four dashes and then you got an easier to read QR code. Save your tip for the day. Um, and the face here, the, this little robot, um, so QR codes are kind of ugly. UUIDs are kind of ugly. But hashing things into cute ro robots are really cool, right? So if we decide, like, these bytes mean this color and all that. So there is an algorithm in this demo that um, if you put any QR code, you get a somewhat unique-ish uh, robot face out of it. OK, a little bit more setup here. Um, since this is front end, video tag, everybody knows what a video tag is in HTML5 video. Um, inline styles. I'm sure somebody will yell about me putting an inline style there, but I want to put the video in the back. Uh, canvas in the front, right? A um, little bit more demo setup. Uh, 3JS was discussed earlier. 3JS is awesome. 3JS has this trick you can do where you can say the alpha on your uh, uh, renderer is, uh, you can make it transparent, and you can set a clear color. I'm not sure why it all works like this, but what this does is gives us a 3JS without a background, right? So a transparent 3JS. And it's a little bit more setup. Um, the barcode detector API, which I've gotten here, can also run in a web worker. So even if it's a CPU intensive task, we can background that in a thread. Um, can, uh, with Chrome 61, also uh, Canvas, uh, off-screen Canvas was added, but we don't need that for this. All we need to do is get our image data into, um, into the web worker. And uh, that, that image data, if we post to the web worker, is processed. There's also, in this particular demo, a fallback. Um, so I, I don't want to use the fallback, though, because the only good QR code scanner that I found that's completely JavaScript-based um, doesn't give quite the same effect. It gives us three points. The one that's built in um, gives us four points around a thing, and that makes a difference for, for what I'm going to do here. Although this, the other way still works, but, but the uh, native barcode detection um, experimental works better. OK. So that was way too much setup for, for this demo. But um, OK, so like I said, video, we could just use uh, get user media to put into that video. And we can use the QR code scanning. Now, what, what this is doing is um, th this is not a real AR framework, right? Like ARJS, go use that. Um, there's uh, another one that just came out by, by Google. Um, the, the stuff that I've seen Jerome do with ARJS is really cool. But what this is doing is um, if we're going to use a marker like uh, ARJS is doing, maybe that marker should be a little bit more significant than just, hey, there is a thing here. Well, that thing could correspond to something that's actually a device that we can read and write data to, right? So if uh, you have something, say, as simple, oh, also, this isn't a plastic box, because I've done demos before without plastic boxes. If you're ever going to do a hardware demo, put it in a plastic box, or you'll totally screw it all up. Um, if uh, we take accelerometer data, and then we encode it as MIDI bytes, then we can take sensor data, just match that up with something in the real world. So, so just think of this as sort of the start of, OK, um, we can have IoT devices you know, either beaconing or you know, tethered or whatever that are emitting data that correspond to something um, in the real world that we're able to then change the display with augmented reality. Right? And all of this right here is being done without like, any major toolkit other than uh, 3JS. But if, uh, you don't even have to use that if you know how to do the like, really crazy WebGL stuff without 3JS. Um, so it doesn't really need much more than we're scanning a QR code and uh, um, finding that position. There was a little bit of math here that I had to learn to do that, right? Like we're taking four points, but I'm able to get like 
angles and stuff out of it, because we can translate those four points into 3D coordinate space with something called a posit algorithm. I didn't even know what to search for, but I managed to eventually find that. So anyways, that's uh, uh, about the gist of it. So just think about um, potentially some of the, these, uh, uh, these tools that we have, this, this sort of toy box of things that we have now um, in browser that we can, we can just build things on top of and, and stitch together IoT, AR, uh, you know, web VR, all of that. It's, it's just been a lot of fun lately, kind of connecting the, the pieces. That, that's all I got. Thank you so much, Louis. That was a really sick demo. I'm impressed nothing went wrong. <laughs> yeah, same. Um, I have a question here for you. Are there APIs that you want to see happen in the browser that aren't there yet? Um, th there, there is. Uh, so a couple of things. One, I, so I had to sneak over the bytes with MIDI. We can maybe use Web USB. It's available in browser. I'd like to see just a web serial for the you know older devices. Also, the one that I think is super important is some way to do UDB broadcasting. That also sounds like super dangerous. Like, can I just broadcast? But the the handshake that I did with the P2P thing, like the the you know sending it over somehow. If we could uh, be servers with either Bluetooth, you know, if we weren't just clients from our machines, if we could also broadcast something that another one can pick up, we could potentially, you know, uh, build actual um, mesh networks. We could do uh, more of this decentralized computing if we had a way of broadcasting things out. So as soon as that happens, a whole new class of just browser-based, no, you know, no extension applications open up. Very, very cool. We're going to break a little bit early to get ready for the lightning talks. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you, Louis. Sure. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> All right.